Well, welcome everyone. I'm uh, here speaking to you today from our office in uh, the Lake Tahoe area here in our conference room. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, um, to today's Social Security 101, which is our introduction to Social Security. Uh, we'll cover several different facets of Social Security. I'll go through those in a second. Uh, just touching base real quick on next week. Uh, Medicare is Monday. That's a pretty uh, long presentation. It is, uh, it's a one-time deal, so we don't split it up like we do Social Security. And then uh, uh, on Tuesday, I will be uh, speaking about <clears throat> economic impacts of Ukraine. I just you know, want to say on the record here that um, having served in two wars, it is just an absolute tragedy what we're seeing happen over there. Um, you know, the economic impact is obviously second and not nearly as important as the human and the humanitarian impact. And um, so, you know, if you do join us for that next week, I just want to be clear that uh, we're not um, – not thinking about the humanitarian crisis that's happening there. So uh, certainly everybody that is over there is in our thoughts and prayers. Um, that being said, let's get to social security because I know a lot of you uh, are probably either first time claimers or looking to claim or maybe looking to retire. And I started doing this presentation about 10 years ago here at UCSD um, <clears throat> early on in my career and found that uh, as we went along and as I gained more experience in the industry, I'm actually in my I believe it's my 13th year in the industry, um, that Social Security is a much larger portion of people's retirement than they initially think, right? And so just to kind of give you a framework around that, um, let's say you're retiring from UCSD and you have your pension, and let's say pension's you know, $50,000 or 60000 annually, and I'm just throwing some numbers out here. Let's say you've saved up a million dollars in your 403B, 457, your retirement plans. So, you know, what portion would Social Security, well, if you've saved up a million dollars and you have a 50 or $60,000 pension, you probably, you know, made somewhere in that range, maybe 80 to 100,000 annually uh, while you were working. <clears throat> so, if that's the case and you're going into retirement and you're looking for a certain amount of retirement income, so if you have a million dollars, you're roughly going to, you know, maybe 30 to 40,000 of withdrawals out of your IRA or 403B, your pension, maybe 50, 60,000, right? So that gets you about 90,000. And then Social Security, especially if you were an income earner, a six-figure income earner or a high five-figure income earner during your years at UCSD, what you'll find is as you go into Social Security and you begin claiming, depending on your, your age and uh, how long you put into the system and what your income was, but it could be over a third of your retirement income, maybe even for some of you up to half of your retirement income. So it ends up being a very large piece. And again, when we talk about retirement and we talk about financial planning and retirement and all these things, we never talk about gross numbers. <clears throat> we talk about net. And of course, you know, we all here are California residents. Well, actually I'm not, but you guys are all California residents. And, you know, it's no, no secret that California is progressively one of the highest tax states in the union. And one of the beautiful parts about Social Security, as we'll talk about here in a second, is it's not taxed at the state level at all. So the dollar of Social Security, if you leave anything today and you don't join us for advanced Social Security, if you leave with one thing today from the presentation, I want you to be <clears throat> very clear on the fact that a dollar up from Social Security is worth more to you than a dollar from your pension or a dollar out of your IRA, 403B, 457, 401k, whatever it happens to be, all right? So keep that in the back of your mind because, again, in retirement, it's not about the gross number that we pull out. It's about the net, what goes into our pocket when we're no longer working. All right, so let's start going through the slides here, Vanya, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> so here, here's the premise, right? People are hurting their retirements by making terrible, costly, uninformed, I would add, uh, decisions, or misinformed is probably even better. Because, uh, you know, everybody's got an opinion on Social Security. You know, politics always weighs into everything, it seems like, nowadays. Um, but I'm here today to, to remove the politics, to remove the misinformation or the fake news, whatever you want to call it, uh, and really get down to, you know, the viability of Social Security uh, and, and claiming strategies and things you really, really need to know about. Next slide. All right. So, first of all, you have a lot of claiming options, right? It's very complex. It took me the better part of probably two years to really, really in depth understand the social security system, uh, understand, you know, the different options you have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, understanding that those decisions have far reaching consequences. If you are the primary breadwinner in your family uh, and you are eligible for social security and your spouses as well, then you are potentially providing a survivorship benefit for your spouse for the rest of their life. If you are to predecease them, right? So there's far reaching consequences. Uh, choice certainly impacts both spouses, right? 
Um, first of all, system is not bankrupt and it's not a Ponzi scheme. We'll go through some of the numbers here specifically in a second. And the benefits likely helped a family member, meaning that you were likely to provide a benefit for someone else in your life as well, if you, again, were the primary worker here. And just remember, friends aren't experts, right? This is, this is uh, one of those often talked about um, topics around dinner tables, uh, you know, you're out to eat with friends, around lunch, uh, you know, the community center, uh, you know, wherever you, you know, like to socialize. I, I hear this all the time. And, and I'll tell you also, I've lecture, I've done this lecture now for many years to other professionals. So accountants, CPAs, bookkeepers, uh, lawyers, attorneys, you name it, other financial advisors, financial planners. And I have to tell you, there is a lot of misunderstanding out there when it comes to Social Security and claiming strategies, and most importantly, the value of Social Security in retirement. Next slide. So, you know, what are the main topics we're going to discuss today? So the bottom two uh, we're really going to focus on in the next presentation, which is maximizing benefits and, you know, how do you lump it into a full retirement? Today, we're really going to focus on the top three, which, you know, will Social Security be there for me? How much can I expect to receive from Social Security? And, you know, we'll start digging into applying for benefits and, and what that looks like. Next slide. So let's understand the value of Social Security. Next slide. So <laughs> one more. All right. Did we skip over one there? I think we may have skipped over a slide and may, or maybe my presentation got out of order. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. It looks like a slide has accidentally been deleted, but I did update this uh, yesterday, the OASDI trust fund. So does anybody uh, know what OASDI stands for by chance? You want to put it in the chat there? Out of curiosity, a little trivia fact. Anyone, anyone want to venture a guess? These presentations are certainly a lot easier to do when, <laughs> no, that's a good answer. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie, for the uh, uh, comedy there. Um, so OASDI is Old Age Survivor Disability Insurance Trust Fund, right? So remember the genesis of Social Security was not to be a retirement plan. It's created in the Social Security Act. Oh, there you go, from Deborah. Yep, Old Age Survivor Disability. And so it was created in 1935 under the Social Security Act, right? To provide a insurance or um, a safety net, if you will, uh, for surviving spouses. You think back to 1935, the traditional family, the husband goes off to work, maybe has a pension, most likely probably has a pension, works at GE or whatever company, you know, the railroad, the, the, the mine, the whatever it happens to do. Comes home, <clears throat> wife stays at home, children again, this, you know, 1935. And what was happening was, you know, as the husband would die off, it would leave the wife impoverished, right? Or the family impoverished. And so that's why it was initially created under the New Deal in 1935. So ever since then, there's been this trust fund that's managed by the Social Security actuaries or the Social Security Administration, right? The Office of the Actual Actuary of Social Security. And they, they put out this report every year of the size and either growth or decline of the Social Security trust fund. And so just to give you some numbers, again, sitting around that table at dinner, uh, speaking to you know, friends and telling you that Social Security is a Ponzi scheme, it's going broke. Well, the trust fund balance as of 12-31-2019, so right, right before the pandemic hit, just under 3 trillion at 2.897 trillion, okay? Trillion, that's trillion with a T, right? And in 2018, total income was 1.118 trillion, right? And where's that income come from? That comes from all of us out there working, right? Every uh, time I get a paycheck, I pay what? Social Security wage taxes, right? FICA taxes. You might be familiar with them on your um, on your paycheck, okay? 6.2% uh, on the employee side, 6.2% is matched by the employer side, right? So those are the Social Security wage taxes, right? And there's a limit or a cap on that we'll discuss in a second. Um, but that's where the income to Social Security comes from. It doesn't come from investing or investments or anything else, right? Social Security Trust Fund is held exclusively in specific treasuries that are exclusive to uh, uh, Social Security. They're a separate type of treasury. They're not traded or anything like that. Um, total expenditures, meaning how, many, how much was paid out in benefits. So $1.107 trillion in benefits was paid out in 2018. So net increase in assets, actually, so that says 2018 up there. I didn't adjust that. So this is actually for 2020. So a net increase in assets of $10.9 billion, right? So the Social Security Trust Fund, despite the fact in 2020, we were in the midst of a pandemic and so many people were unemployed actually grew. I want to repeat that. The Social Security Trust Fund actually grew in 2020. 
okay? Which is pretty shocking because I've been doing this presentation again for over 10 years. And every year <clears throat> I do it, there's this projection by the Social Security Trust Fund that says that it's going to start bleeding into the, the, the balance of the trust fund, meaning that expenditures will rise above income. So let's go to the next slide. In fact, this is the slide that they've had out forever and ever and ever showing expenditures crossing income, right, as the baby boomers move into retirement and, and fully uh, begin collecting Social Security. And that was projected, projected to be somewhere around 2010 if you look down at the bottom left of the graph. The bottom line is here we are in 2020, or excuse me, 2022, looking at 2020 numbers, and income is still higher than, in the midst of a recession, was higher than expenditures. So anyone out there that tells you that Social Security is going broke, um, there's certainly you know, an issue, and the issue is uh, the long-range projection is that by you know, 2034, roughly, that they wouldn't be able to pay out 100% of the benefit, right? And so what does that mean? Does it mean your Social Security payment stops? No. It means it would fall to about 79% of where it is without any projected changes whatsoever. I, I, I want to be clear. Social Security can never run out of money because as long as there's people working, there are people putting into the system, that immediately gets turned around to beneficiaries, right? So anyone that ever tells you it's going broke or it's, going, it's not going to be there at all is uninformed about or misinformed or uninformed about the actual way Social Security or the trust fund works, okay? Uh, next slide, please. So what would it take to, to restore solvency within the system? Well, a couple of the reform proposals that are being studied, right? Increase the maximum earning subject to Social Security tax. I love that this is on the slideshow because this has happened every year I've done this presentation. When I started doing this presentation, the maximum uh, wage is subject to Social Security was about 108000 Now it's up 142800 in 2021. Just to be clear on that, that is about a 35% increase in 10 years, right? So each and every year, uh, the maximum earning subject to Social Security tax seems to uh, keep rising. And, and by the way, real quick, for those of you that may be confused, Medicare is unlimited, right? You, you pay Medicare tax on income up to you know tens of millions or whatever. But Social Security is capped at 142.8. Um, <clears throat> raise the normal retirement age? Well, currently 66 for individuals born between 43 and 54. But for people like myself, born after 1960, it's 67. So they've already done that. Originally, Social Security, full retirement age was 65, right? Uh, that, that was raised. And so I, my expectation is probably one place that, that they would change significantly. Maybe I'm um, Generation X, maybe not for Gen X, maybe uh, for the millennials, we'll see. Uh, but you know that I would not be surprised to see them raise that as we live longer life expectancies and we're in the workforce longer. I would not be surprised to see this raise to you know 70 or something like that. Uh, lower benefits for f future retirees. You know this is one of those <clears throat> um, solutions that I think politically is just untenable. Uh, you know the largest voting bloc in our country by far still happens to be the baby boomers, right? As a percentage of the populace. You're not the largest generation anymore, the millennials are, but you vote a lot more consistently than the millennials do, right? And so if you're a politician and you wanna lose a bunch of votes real quick, tell the, ba the baby boomers, right? That they're, they're gonna lose their social security benefits. That'd be a really quick way to, 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 to lose your office or lose an election. So I don't see that as very tenable when it comes to, um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, you know, a, a realistic change in the system. Uh, some people have suggested maybe it gets means tested. So if your adjusted gross income is over a million, you don't get your social security benefit. The problem with that is that just wouldn't it wouldn't affect enough people, especially in retirement. Um, it's hard to find a lot of people making a million dollars in retirement. I mean, you have to have a really, 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 really big um, uh, pot to draw on in retirement to to, to be making a million or more, or even five hundred thousand or more. So there's just not enough people out there that you would uh, take benefits from. And again, remember, Social Security. For one third, roughly, of this country, their only retirement is Social Security, meaning that is they don't have a pension, they have not saved anything. The only thing they have is Social Security. Okay, so <clears throat> it'd be really, really difficult, I think, uh, from a political standpoint and from a you know humanitarian standpoint, if you will, uh, to, to lower benefits and then re reduce the cost of living adjustments. You know, they've been pretty low uh, until recently. Uh, I'm expecting a really, really big one here, probably. Uh, for 2022. I'll go into that a little bit later when I get to the COLA. Next slide. Bottom line here, your benefits are not likely to be affected by Social Security reform. All the way up until, like I said, my generation, Generation X, would be the first time I think Social Security reform will really, really start to affect uh, a you know, greater populace. Next slide. 
what's a clearer way to think about Social Security? Next slide. <clears throat> well, I think it's really important to understand that Social Security is somewhat similar to your uh, pension at UCSD. It's inflation protected income, right? The difference, and this is what you're really, really going to see this year, right? The UCSD uh, pension, right? You get dollar for dollar uh, um, protection of inflation increase up to 2%, I believe is what it is last time I looked. And then for each percentage after that, I think you either get a quarter or a half a percent increase. Okay. Well, Social Security is much more mono y mono, meaning <clears throat> I was just looking at some of the projections for Social Security which is the COLA, by the way, the cost of living adjustment is based off of what's called CPIW, the Consumer Price Index for Working Individuals. Year over year, that's up over 6%. So what does that mean? More likely than not, when the Social Security actuaries come out and announce the, um, the COLA increase for 2022, you're going to see something in the neighborhood on your Social Security payments of an increase of 6 7%, right? Um, that is not what you would get at UCSD. You'd get probably half of that in your pension plan, right? So again, think of Social Security income as inflation protected income, right? You paid the premium in every paycheck. So be smart about how and when to collect it. Next slide. So real quickly, if your monthly benefit today is 2000 and you live 10 more years, 20 or 30 more years, look at the amount of total benefit you'll receive. So let's say you're retiring and you're 65 and your life expectancy is maybe 90 to 95. Let's say you're going to live to be 95. That's 30 years. That benefit or that pot of money, that future stream of income, is worth $1.122 million, right? So that is a significant pot of income, right? So you have to think about Social Security as this you know, million dollar pot you have laying around. And I think it's really, really important to understand the value of that. And, it, and also, as I said earlier, that 1.1 million that you have in Social Security future benefits is worth significantly more than, to you than if you had 1.1 million in an IRA. And I'll go through that in a second and why. Next slide. <clears throat> So you get the, you know, the annual inflation adjustments, you know, inflation in the last, like I said, 10 years I've been doing this. I don't think I've talked about inflation almost at all other than talking about the COLA, right? Now we're definitely having that conversation, right? You know, what are CDs paying today? You know, up, maybe up towards to 1%. Um, treasuries, I just looked at the 10-year treasuries at 2.19 or something like that, 2.1. Um, you know, most municipal bonds are out there paying uh tax quote yield of two, three percent and inflation is running six, seven percent, right? And so it's not difficult to see that you're getting what's called a negative real rate of return, meaning that after inflation, right, you're actually losing money. And so again, that's what makes Social Security so valuable for you, especially as you are aging and getting into retirement. And as you're diversifying your investments between stocks and bonds and all these other things, it's really important to consider the benefit that Social Security provides, right? So <clears throat> next slide. I'm sorry, can you go back one slide real quick? So again, just to think of it in a, as a monthly cash flow, right? Your benefit, let's just go 20 years from now. If you started at 2000 a day because of that COLA at 2.6%, that increases and you'll in 20 years, that pay paycheck will be 3342, right? Not quite double, but in 30 years, it'll be more than double. And I would argue that if inflation runs significantly higher over the next you know, five, 10 years, you're going to see these numbers actually increase substantially. Next slide. One more, please, Bonnie. All right, so what does your Social Security benefit depend on? Well, how much you earned over your working career and the age at which you uh, apply for benefits. So one of the two of those you can't do anything about at this point, right? You can't go back and, and earn more in the past in your past working career. So really the one you need to focus on is the age at which you apply for benefits. Next slide. Yeah, so how are they calculated? How are those benefits calculated? So at age 62, each year's Earnings are tallied it up in index for inflation. And here's the important part. It takes the highest 35 years of earnings are average, right? It's called the AIME. It doesn't really matter uh, that you know how the formula works, even though on the next slide I'll show you. Um, <clears throat> what really matters is what your PIA is, your primary insurance amount, right? And that's your benefit at your full retirement age. More importantly, if you have not worked 35 years, you've not been, maybe stepped out of the labor force to have children, uh, maybe you lost a job at some point, maybe you were in transition, moved, whatever it happens to be. If you don't have 35 years of earnings, right, then your Social Security benefit will only increase with each additional year that you work because you're, you're basically taking zeros out of that formula, okay? 
Um, and, and, and another thing to know, if you delay collecting your benefit, this is really important. If you delay collecting your benefit and you don't collect the benefit on day one, or meaning 62, uh, you still get the cost of living adjustments each year on your benefit. Okay, so the cost of living adjustment isn't just for when you're collecting, uh, it's also uh, when you're not collecting. Uh, question here, do they pick the top paid 35 years or is this averaging? Nope, uh, Nancy got it exactly right. They take your top 35 years of earnings, right? Um, and then they average those out for the AME formula. So next slide. You're absolutely welcome. Thank you for the question. So here's how uh, the formula is calculated. Uh, the only thing you really need to know about this is Social Security, you know, a lot of people say, well, Medicare is means tested for, you know, the IRMA, the inc what's called the uh, monthly adjustment based on your adjusted gross or modified adjusted gross income. Um, and they say, well, Social Security isn't, it mean, you know, means tested. It's, that's actually not true at all. Because the way these bend points are, uh, it goes like this, shallower and then shallower. And so the very, the, the most benefit is accrued at the lowest wage levels. It's probably hard to explain when I don't have my whiteboard in front of me, I'm not standing in front of you, but the bottom line is uh, social security for the, the, the first 30 or 35,000 or so you make, that's you accrue a much larger benefit than 30, 35% for that first 30%. Next slide. Uh, yeah, but why shouldn't I claim early at 62 instead of delaying before retirement age or even 70? Well, let's talk about that. Next slide. So your monthly benefit is reduced if you claim early. Early claiming is any time before your full retirement age. We'll go through those dates here in a second. But it's reduced for taxes and Medicare premiums, right? It's called the actuarial reduction. That's, that's part of uh, taking the benefit early. Next slide. One more. All right, so factors to consider when deciding when to apply, right? Your health status, your life expectancy, certainly your need for income, and whether or not you plan to work and your survivor's needs. Next slide. Okay, next slide. This is okay. Here we go. I was gonna say, it seems like the, some of the slides are out of order for some reason. So, Vani, I'm wondering if somehow you guys got a different presentation, or maybe I sent you the wrong one. Anyhow, full retirement age. Uh, so, this is important to know uh, 43 to 54, most of you probably after that, full retirement age is 66. And why is this important to know? Because this is the first time that you're not subject to the earnings test, uh, which is a test that is apply towards your um, adjusted gross income or your modified adjusted gross income to determine if you'll get your full benefit. So again, if you apply for social security benefits before your full retirement age, right, <clears throat> then you are potentially subject to what's called the earnings test. Is there a difference in social security benefit if you apply for social security at age 69 than at age 70? Uh, Nancy, yes, absolutely. There's an 8% difference. It's called a DRC. We'll get to it in a second, a delayed retirement credit. And so these are your full retirement age. This is very important to know, uh, not only from a standpoint of, of when you can actually claim without being subject to that, that earnings test, but this is also um, when a spouse can get her full spousal benefit as well as at full retirement age. Next slide. All right. So what is the problem with claiming early? So if, let's say my full retirement age is 66, okay, and I apply at 62. I'm only going to get 75% of that benefit I see in my Social Security uh, on the Social Security site when I go in there to determine my benefits. So you're taking a 25% pay cut to claim four years early. So the natural question is, well, <clears throat> I'm claiming earlier, so I have four years of benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, that is true. And so, well, when is the crossover? Well, a lot of people do all these, especially the engineers in here. That I get a lot of um, you know databases that show. Uh, if I claim it's 62 versus 70, 66 versus 70, all these different databases on all these different things. Well, the problem is the majority of the time what's left out is calculating not only the DRC or the actuarial reduction, but also calculating the cost of living adjustment as it goes, right? And the larger benefit, obviously, with a cost of living adjustment um, is much nominally increases more than it does at age 62. All right. So next slide, please. So if you wait till your full retirement age or after, and this is where we get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of Social Security. This is the part that I like the best because I think this is the most pertinent to people that are retiring. All right. So you get an 8% annual delayed retirement credit each year you delay after full retirement age. So at age 66, right, if I delay to 67, now I'm at 108%. If I delay to 68, 116%, 69, 124, et cetera, et cetera. And you also have to add in the cost of living adjustment, which is average 2.6% since 1982. Uh, and 
<laughs> will probably be significantly more than that this year. The other thing I would say, and again, thinking about this, uh, can you give me control real quick so I can share a whiteboard here real quick? Yes, I believe you should have um, that capability. Right. Thank you. All right, so I, I want to be clear here. Of, and the, again, this is the value that I think is way, way under appreciated about Social Security. So let's say I have, you know, these four uh, buckets here. Uh, this is my retirement, right? And I've got, I don't know, I got a pension here from UCSD. I've got my 403B, 457. We'll just call it an IRA because I roll it all into an IRA uh, when I retire, right? I've got what we're talking about today, which is Social Security. And uh, maybe I've saved some money and I got a brokerage account or a trust account, hopefully. Uh, you guys know the value of having a trust, right? And so this is my retirement, right? And I, all of this is coming back down here to what I call my mailbox money, right? This is how I'm retiring, okay? And this is what's going to determine uh, what, what my retirement looks like. Well, the pension here on the right, and again, I want you to really, really think about it this way. The pension here uh, has two things. First of all, it's guaranteed, so that's a big check, right? Um, you know, subject obviously to the California taxpayer and everything else. Uh, but it, and so this is guaranteed, let's call it by the state of California. Okay. And from a tax standpoint, you pay federal taxes, right? From the feds and you pay California state income tax on every dollar comes out. Okay. Then you got your IRA here. Okay. That's that 403B 457. It's invested in the market. Is it guaranteed by anybody? Absolutely not. Right. We've seen this year that the, you know, nice big correction that we're in right now. Uh, accounts are probably down across the board where they have bonds or stocks. And so this is not only not guaranteed, but this has you know, fluctuations in what we call risk, right, in retirement. Uh, at the state level, yep, it's taxed. And at the federal level, yep, it's taxed. So from a tax standpoint, there's two check marks here, two check marks over here as well, all right? Uh, that trust account that we have, is it guaranteed by any government? Nope, right? Uh, at the federal level, is it taxed? Absolutely, when we take our capital gains out, are, but it's, it should be a, a, a small check, I should say, because it's potentially tax advantaged, or if you have municipal bonds, something like that, maybe get it tax free. At the state level, yes, it's taxed, but I'll put another little check there because uh, it could be taxed if you have, again, munis in California, you don't get taxed on. Everything else in California, those are ordinary. Well, what about this Social Security bucket, right? Is it guaranteed? Absolutely. Who's it guaranteed by? USA, right? The American taxpayer. So I would say USA is more than or better than California from a guarantee, right? California has, what, 40 million people? USA has 350 million, something like that. So I'm going to go with this one as being the more guaranteed, first of all. At the federal level, how is it taxed? Oh, that's right. We're going to put a small check because at the most, 85 cents on the dollar is taxed in Social Security. And in California, is it taxed? Nope. It's not taxed at all. And it's guaranteed, right? So if I look at these four different sources of income and retirement, which one am I preferential to? I'm going to go with this one, okay? The other thing about this one is if we delay past that full retirement age, right, we're going to get 8% every year plus what? Plus a COLA that actually matches true inflation, especially if we're going into an inflationary environment. Let's go back over here to our, our lovely pension. All right, you get an 8% by delaying it? Nope. And it's COLA. Yes, you do get the COLA, you get the first 2%, and then after that, you get a little less, right? So I would say you get a little check for your COLA there, but not nearly as good as you do over here. On your IRA, on the other hand, with your IRA, are you getting the 8% DRC? Nope, you're subject to the risk of the market. Are you getting colas? Nope, subject to the risk of the market. Again, this, as you age and get older, becomes you know, less and less risky, and the chances of you beating this 8%, right, plus this cola, very unlikely, okay? And then again, we could say the same thing over here. So, do I need to take it back to the slides, or do I need to give you back control, because I'm done here with the, there we go. Um, yeah, I will take it back. So from Jack, great question. Does income include a pension and what does income? So income, uh, no, a pension is, is not considered income. Income is going to be W-2 wages or 1099 income, not a uh, pension. Uh, another thing with the, the, the calculator, Jack, um, so 
one of the things I tell people when they're looking at their social security statements, the, the social security administration grossly underestimates on the, the website, what you actually get. The only time that number is correct is the day you turn age 62 because what they do not do is calculate future income into the equation. And they also, so you can put that in there like Jack was just asked about. Uh, but the other thing they do not do is they do not calculate a COLA because they don't have the COLA for future years and they don't want to make assumptions. That's one of the beautiful things about the program I have that the social security analysis is I can tell you both of those, right? Or we can, you know, put different assumptions in there and just watch my time here. We've got about 10 more minutes of this presentation. So again, you know, I just went through the whiteboard and I talked about delayed retirement credits, how important they are. Uh, you know, the 8% plus the cost of living adjustment guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, I think is grossly underestimated from a value standpoint for someone's retirement. Next slide. So this is how you get your benefits, right? Or, or how you get your estimation. Again, um, if you go to socialsecurity.gov and you click on estimate your retirement benefits, just as Jack was doing, you're going to have to put a lot of inputs in there. And I want to be very clear, that is an estimation. It's not a guarantee. It's more likely to be significantly higher. Next slide. So, you know, why would we delay benefits, right? Again, uh, assuming you have a primary insurance amount of 2,800, 2.6% annual uh, COLA from age 62, you can see here down at the bottom, benefit without COLA. And this is, this is exactly what the Social Security uh, website is going to show you. It's going to show you this, this column that says benefit without COLAs. So on your 62nd birthday, you're looking at it, you see, you know, your, your primary insurance amount is 2,800 and you're looking and you're going, oh, 1960, that's my benefit at age, you know, 62. And it's going to calculate 3,472 as your benefit at age 70. But again, it doesn't count in the COLA and using a very low COLA, 2.6%, right? I think we can all agree inflation is running significantly higher than that. Your benefit actually would be 4,263 at 70. And even at your full retirement age, or age of 67 in this case, would be 3183. So 1963 versus just waiting to 67, 3183, you know, that's a significant difference. It's over $1,200 or almost $1,200 a month, right? Actually over $1,200 a month. That's a significant difference. And then if we go out to age 70, it's not double, it's double and then some, right? And remember that that dollar of social security is worth so much more to you than that IRA or pension dollar because of the inflation protection and because of <clears throat> because of the, the, the benefits with taxation. Um, one of the things I tell people as they get, you know what, uh, Vanya, if you can, I'm kind of going all over. Uh, this, this, Rita, this is being recorded. I'm sorry, I'm a little all over the place today, but I'm going to share my screen again. I, I, I want to um, just kind of hit something home here. <laughs> Let me get this beautiful drawing out of the way here. As you go into retirement, I want you to think about your overall portfolio. You know, we, we've all learned of the value of diversification and we have all these different investments and all that stuff, right? And markets, you know, trend up and they get a correction and then we have a recession and then, you know, they do like they're doing right now and, you know, all this different stuff, right? And what is this called? This is called volatility, right? And if you're taking, you know, money out every single point along the way, right, which is what happens in retirement, right? You get some of these, this is called downside capture, right? And this is why I tell people, wouldn't you want to exchange a dollar of your portfolio out for a dollar of social security? We've already talked about the dollar comes out of here, it gets taxed at a federal and state, right? You have investment fees, expenses, you have expense ratio. Maybe you employ somebody like me uh, to help you uh, invest your, you know, your assets, but isn't this dollar over here worth a lot more to you? Not just from a taxation standpoint, but think about it from retirement and, and just your mentality in retirement. Do we get more conservative or less conservative as we go further and further in retirement and we're no longer making money? I think it's a pretty easy answer, right? We get more conservative. We get more concerned about our investments, this and that and the other. So by shifting a dollar, let's say from 62 to 70, while you're delaying, delaying your social security, and you're drawing down this IRA asset, what are you essentially doing? You're taking a dollar out of here and turning it into a future social security dollar so that you are taking less of this risk as you get further and further into your retirement, right? I call that 
a win. Okay. The other thing you're doing is you're paying less in fees and expenses. I don't care if you're an indexer or you like nothing but actively manage funds, whatever. There is always a cost, right, to a portfolio. And that portfolio also has that big bad R word, right? Risk. Okay. I showed you the long term projections on Social Security. And I would say this is a risk with the majority of my clients we're willing to take. This to take a dollar out of here during your 60s and move it over here for this guaranteed benefit that comes from full faith and credit of the United States government with a COLA that actually matches inflation, right? 100% survivorship to your, your, your surviving spouse if they're eligible for Social Security. These are all really good things. And most importantly, it's much more tax efficient than any of this other stuff. So, Vonnie, go ahead and take it back, if you, if you will, please, um, back to the slides. As we wrap up the uh, Social Security 101, the primer here. All right, next slide. <clears throat> you know, again, delaying benefits, just another way to look at it. If I claim at 62, by the time I'm 80 and my, my benefit was 2,800, by the time I'm 80, it's 3,111. If I waited to 70, it's now 5,500. You know, my father and uh, stepmother took my social security advice. My father waited till he was 70. And my father was also married to my mother um, for over 10 years before they were divorced after 14 years. Uh, so my mother's also eligible for a spousal benefit off of my father. So my father's big benefit, if he were to pass away, would provide two survivor benefits, one for his current wife of 20 something years and my mother as well. And I think it's really important to understand is that social security is not just about the primary earner and the primary claimant. It's also about who you're providing this for later on down the road. Next slide. So I'm going to stop here because this is normally uh, where we pick up a social security part two. And uh, when we try to do this whole presentation at once, uh, it would go an hour and 15 hour and 20 minutes and we would, uh, you know, pretty much not have any time for questions. So I want to stop here. I want to open the floor for questions. I, you know, when I say this is a primer, uh, the biggest thing I would like you to leave with today is hopefully understanding the value of a dollar of Social Security, how it can help uh, minimize risk, uh, not com completely get rid of it, but can, can help reduce risk in retirement, can help reduce your investment fees and expenses in retirement, uh, can help protect your retirement from inflation, Right, which is all good things, um, and most importantly, give a uh, a survival benefit to uh, a spouse down the road. Uh, in the next presentation next Thursday, we'll talk about survivor benefits. We'll talk about spousal benefits uh, and some other tactics within Social Security. Some some rules of thumb. From Nancy Daly, are pension funds and trust funds, when drawn down, taxed at the same rate as our income has been? Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's all based on your adjusted gross income. Uh, so. Pension funds, yes, because that's considered income, right? Uh, trust fund, meaning if you have, let's say you save money in a trust, it's 500000 It can be taxed at, in California, there's no capital gains tax, there's no dividend tax, it's all ordinary income. So California, it's taxed the same. At the federal level, dependent on the characterization, is it a qualified dividend that's a different rate? Um, is it a, so the bottom line is, the answer to your question, pension funds, yes, trust funds, potentially, but most likely not. Um, that's why it's incredibly important to be tax efficient in retirement and why I'm a big advocate of maximizing Social Security and not taking it early. When you die, you said we get our spouse benefits. Is that true or do we get that which is greater? Uh, yeah, so you get which is greater. That's a good question, Valerie. That's something I'll cover in a part two is how spousal and survivor benefits actually work. Um, but just to, to jump to it, um, the, so again, there's two different benefits. There's a spousal benefit and a survivor. Um, you're speaking of what's called a survivor benefit, and you would get the greater of the two dependent on when you claim it. And there's some strategies in there too. And that's what I'll be going through next time is you know different rules of thumb. I'll uh, bring a couple of uh, sample uh, social security questionnaires. Uh, one of the things Suzanne always likes me to mention is part of my uh, giving back to UCSD uh, the Investment Interest Group and the RRC, the Retirement Resource Center, is uh, we do, our team does uh, custom Social Security analysis for free for UCSD folks. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, you can certainly uh, go back to the slides and, and my, my email will be up there. Um, and I'm happy to send those out to anyone. We have a little questionnaire that you fill out and it's done. So let me just put my email here in the chat.
What is the difference between spousal and survivor benefits? Another good question, Valerie. Uh, spousal, obviously the spouse is still alive. The survivor is uh, one of the two spouses has passed away and you're claiming off of their benefit once they've passed. And the difference for, in, between spousal and survivor uh, from a uh, income or not an income standpoint, from a how much is the benefit standpoint could be substantially different. Because spousal benefits are limited to 50% of the primary benefit if they claim at full retirement age or later. Uh, survivor benefit is 100% at full retirement age or later. A lot of little nuances in Social Security. So I'm opening the floor for any questions now. Uh, anyone, questions, concerns, emotional outbursts are allowed as well. Okay, I can't wait to get back and doing these uh, in person. I, I'm, I promise you I'm a lot funnier in person than I am on Zoom. <laughs> so no more questions? All right. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate it. Uh, as all you know, um, Suzanne does post these uh, to, uh, there's a library, I believe, on YouTube. Vanya, you can maybe comment on that. Um, yes, all of these so, um, videos are posted on the RA YouTube channel. I'll insert the link in the chat box right now. Um, fantastic. But otherwise, thank you so much, Ryan. That was a great presentation. I'm sure everyone agrees. And would you like me to put up the slide with your contact information one more time? Yeah, do you mind doing that just so everybody has my contact information? Like I said, <laughs> my contact information and my picture from 2005 that Suzanne refuses to change out. That was me about 15, 17 years ago when I was in the Navy living in Bahrain. So I look a little different now. It's because the age uh, does catch up after a while, right? Especially children. I, <laughs> yeah, that was prior to my two. I have two little girls and two dogs. So uh, that was prior. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. I uh, appreciate that. And it looks like it's beautiful down there in San Diego. We have a storm coming in here in Tahoe, so we're going to get some snow and uh, everything this tonight through tomorrow, which is great. We need uh, more snowpack in the Sierra for water for California, so hoping for big snow. Anyhow, I'll be down in San Diego next week. I'll be speaking to you on Thursday from uh, my house in Cardiff. So I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend, and I look forward to those of you that are going to be here next week.